Wow. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another Pig Lunch and Learn session. And this time we're, we're having a presentation from Decotech, who are a relatively new member of Pig, but certainly not a new player in the field of corrosion protection uh, for pipes with almost 100 years of continuous activity in this area. You'd like to know, we'd like to think that they know a little bit about what they're doing after 100 years. And today, um, they're going to tell us about cold applied tapes on pipes and discuss something about the aging properties of the different types of materials in the pipes and hopefully dispel the myth that all tapes are the same and that when the specification says apply a tape, it doesn't mean you can use any old um, cheap and nasty tape. You really need to use a, a tape, a combination of materials in the tape that's suitable for long-term corrosion protection of the pipe. So the title today uh, of Luke's presentation that you can see on the screen in front of you, and he, he's going to be explaining about the, in particular, the aging properties of PVC and bitumen versus the aging properties of PE, polyethylene and uh, butyl rubber. So uh, during the presentation, I would ask you all to please keep your microphones muted. If you have any questions at any time, please put them in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat on behalf of uh, the presenter. And at the end, I'll present all of the the questions to Luke and his colleagues um, to provide you with the answers. So I hope everybody enjoys the presentation. I, I know the presenters put a lot of effort into putting these together and uh, I hope you'll appreciate it. So I'll pass it over to you, Luke. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ken. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. So as Ken has mentioned, we will talk today about the material performance and we make comparison between different material which are basically used to, to manufacture uh, corrosion protection tapes for pipelines. So those materials are PVC bitumen and polyethylene butyl rubber. So the agenda of the presentation of today is as follows. We will start with the first uh, small introduction. We will go much more into details and explain what is PVC, polyvinyl chloride, then we talk about polyethylene, PE. We will explain much more into details what are bitumens, why they are so complex, a mix of hydrocarbons, and what is PMB, which is polymer modified bitumen. We will then go through the butyl rubber and we finish with some conclusions. So as an introduction, um, what are the objectives of this presentation? It's very important to understand where we want to go. So we want to understand and we want to compare the basic chemistry and the basic properties of each of the materials I just mentioned before, which are the PVC, so the, the poly polyvinyl chloride, the PE polyethylene, the bitumen or polymer modified bitumen, and butyl rubber. And we have a special focus on this. We will focus on the fact that we want to understand why one material or another material is specifically suitable for use in corrosion protection for tapes. That's the objective, that's the target, and we hope you will have a better understanding after this presentation. If you look at, uh, at the history of the different materials which have been used uh, to wrap uh, around pipelines, to be wrapped around pipelines. So we have, at the early 19th, we have the grease or the asphalt tapes. Then they switched to something which was called called an coal tar enamel. And uh, later in the 50s, PVC bitumen tapes appear. Today, the PVC bitumen tapes are, worldwide speaking, are quite uh, limited uh, used. And this is uh, if we compare with polyethylene butyl rubber, which are much more largely used uh, if you look at the entire market around the world. 
in this uh, time scale, we can also uh, focus on two dates. You will understand later why those two dates are important. In 1926, that's the time where PVC started to be plasticized. And in 1953, this is the time when high density polyethylene started to be manufactured. And this was mainly due to uh, the fact that catalyst has been discovered to manufacture polyethylene easier on an easy way. So the structure of the tape, it's uh, like a reminder, we talked about this uh, two weeks ago, exactly. So typically uh, a tape as, uh, as a basic material has two components. One is called the carrier film. The carrier film can be typically a PVC uh, a film, can be a mesh film or a PE polyethylene uh, film. We have also, though this is the, uh, sorry, the carrier film, which is symbolized by this black uh, surface. And the compound, the compound is also called adhesive. Uh, compound is typically made of bitumen or butyl rubber. And if you look at the structure of a tape, we have two structures. The first one is called a two-ply tape system or a three-ply tape system, which where two layers of a compound or adhesive are applied on both sides of the carrier film. When you look at the two-ply tape system, typically uh, it's, it's one of those three compositions, can be PVC with bitumen, can be a mesh with a bitumen, or can be a polyethylene with butyl rubber. While if you look at the three-ply tape system, it is always polyethylene with butyl rubber. So now let's start to, uh, to the details of the presentation and let's start with the first material. We are looking much more into uh, very close. Uh, so let's talk about polyvinyl chloride, which is also called PVC. Uh, for each of those material, I like to make a very short uh, history of the development of each component. So the PVC, the, the product, the, uh, the PVC has been accidentally like most of those materials, has been ac accidentally discovered in France uh, by, by Mr. Regnault in 1835, when he started to synthesize vinyl chloride and expose it to the UV and got like a solid powder. Uh, this was polyvinyl chloride. But of course, he was not really aware of his discovery. It is much later, in 1912, that a German person, Mr. Klatte, synthesized a cl a vinyl chloride from ethylene and hydrogen chloride. And this was the really uh, start foundation of the production of PVC. But at that time, it was still not uh, a successful uh, product. Uh, it was mo more successful in the First World War because of lack of raw materials, so PVC started to be uh, used. But the very most important date that we need to remind uh, in the history of PVC is that PVC has been plasticized uh, from 1926 by blending uh, many various additives to the PVC to make it flexible. And you can imagine that a PVC uh, without plasticizer uh, cannot be used uh, for tapes. Uh, by, by nature, a PVC is a non-flexible, uh, a stiff material, so it's not suitable to be used as a tape. But use of plasticizer change this uh, property. So how is PVC manufactured? As uh, this is the, the general rules, it's not too much into details. So we start from a first molecule, which is called vinyl chloride monomer. So the uh, vinyl chloride is uh, produced by the chemical reaction be between acetylene and hydrogen chloride, which is a gas. And to make those two components react, we need to use a catalyst. And this catalyst in this specific case is mercury chloride. Uh, but the mercury chloride, you, you, you maybe don't know, but it's interesting to know, is a toxic uh, product for the humans. So this is the chemical reaction. 
Uh, from those two components, we make uh, the first uh, vinyl chloride monomer. Uh, this is how it is symbolized as an organic uh, molecule. And uh, when those monomers are put together, there is another chemical reaction, which is the poly polymerization of the vinyl chloride. So from one, from uh, a number of N uh, of uh, basic vinyl chloride, after polymerization, these uh, monomers link together and are making a long chain. This long chain is what we call the PVC. So to make, uh, to make PVC workable, uh, various processing aids needs to be uh, added. For example, PVC needs to, uh, to, to get uh, impact modifiers and thermal modifiers. They, many fillers need to be added. They need some biocides. They need sometimes pigments for the color. And they need plasticizers, as I mentioned before. Without plasticizers, the PVC is stiff, is rigid, and cannot be flexible. And the last but not least, the PVC also need heat stabilizers and heat and UV stabilizers. So we will go much more into details in the next slide of the consequences uh, of those two uh, additional materials. So the plasticizers issue. It is interesting to notice that uh, you need maximum up to 40% of plasticizers to make the PVC flexible. Otherwise, the PVC is not flexible. And this is only valid from minus 18 degrees C and higher. Below uh, minus 18 degrees C, even with plasticizers, the PVC is not flexible or not flexible enough. What happened with the plasticizers? So the plasticizers in PVC are well known to have what we call a sweeting effect. The scientific name of this sweeting effect is exudation. So what is exudation? It's the fact that the plasticizers are not stable in the PVC and they migrate, they are moving, they like evaporate. Where are they going to? They go to the environment and as a consequence, they make the groundwater polluted. But they also go to the adhesive, to the bitumen, if it is a bitumen PVC uh, tape. So, because the uh, plasticizers are leaving the backing, are leaving the PVC, we have a stiffness in retinal issue. And the result of this is to have crackings in the PVC. So I guess you already see this kind of, uh, of failures where PVC pipes can crack and leak. So this is typically uh, due to a plasticizer uh, moving out of the PVC. But because the plasticizers are moving into the adhesive, they plasticize the adhesive, they plasticize the bitumen, and the bitumen becomes gummy. And when the bitumen is, gu is, is becoming gum gummy, it has a much less lap shear resistance. So the result of it is that the, the tape has a, a, a poor lap shear resistance due, due to the fact that the plasticizer migrate into uh, the adhesive, into the bitumen. It is also interesting to notice that plasticizers are suspected to cause uh, cancer to the human being. So this is the plasticizers issue. Let's have a look to the stabilizers issue. What happens when PVC is exposed to some heat? Uh, can be low or high heat, doesn't matter. If it's high, it's faster. If, if it's not uh, too, too, too high, it's the, the process is just slower. But what happens when PVC is exposed to some heat? We have uh, a chemical phenomena which is well known and which is called dehydrochloranization. The dehydrochloranization is the production of a lilac chloride structure and a gas which is called HCl, which is in fact the hydrogen chloride. The allylic chloride structure is a thermal, thermally unstable 
polymer and it is also toxic. The result of this structure is again crackings. The, the gas, the HCl, hydrogen chloride, once it is in contact with water, vapor water, it becomes a hydraulic acid. And hydraulic, hydrochloric acid is a corrosive material. It's a very uh, low pH, and it is also a toxic material. So the stabilizers, what are the functions of the stabilizers? They are added to the PVC to try to reduce the loss of HCl and just to reduce all this phenomena. But the, the chemical reaction or the, the chemical process, dehydrochlorinization is an autocatalyst process. It's like a self-dissolution. So what happened? The component from this reaction, from dehydrochlorinization, the component are catalyst to the, to the same reaction. So it is like a snowball effect. Once the reaction starts, once the process starts, you cannot stop it. There are more and more catalysts released, and thus the catalysts are making sure that the, 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 the chemical reaction happen more and more quickly. So this is the, the issue with the stabilizers, and we just talked before the issue with the plasticizers. Let's have a look now to the polyethylene, PE. Like for PVC, let, let's have a, a quick look to the history. It was in 1898 uh, in Germany again, and again, accidentally, uh, Mr. Uh, somebody, Mr. Peschmann, accidentally synthesized uh, the first uh, molecule, the first molecule for polyethylene. Uh, in 1933, uh, that was in the UK, uh, those two gentlemen synthesized in an industrial process uh, a waxy material, uh, which was in fact uh, the first polyethylene. But to get this material manufactured, they need to apply very high pressure. So in the practice, it was not really convenient to produce uh, polyethylene at that time, as uh, too much pressure was needed to manufacture the, the, the material. And the material produced was only low density polyethylene. Uh, in 1944, in the US, uh, Bakelit Corps and DuPont started to, uh, uh, to sell to commercial the, uh, the, the polyethylene. But the big discovering was in 1951 and 53 in USA and Germany, when uh, they discovered that some catalysts can be added to the chemical reaction to manufacture polyethylene. And because of those catalysts, it was not needed anymore to use very high pressure to manufacture uh, polyethylene. So milk temperature and pressure was needed and was sufficient. So, those, this manufacturing process allowed to produce low density polyethylene and high density polyethylene. And it is today the high density polyethylene, which is mainly used for uh, tapes uh, for corrosion prevention. So let's have a look to how polyethylene is manufactured or uh, the polymerization of the, uh, of the ethylene monomer. So it's again a chemical reaction. So we have the catalyst I just talked before, and we have the monomers like for PVC, but the monomers are from uh, ethylene. So we have one ethylene monomer, we have n times those monomer, and we put a catalyst with those, with this material, and we get one long chain of n times the basic monomer, but they are now linked together. So the monomer molecule, is an ethylene molecule. So this is the ethylene molecule. It's one of the most simple molecule uh, uh, from the al alkene uh, family. So it's a very basic uh, molecule, not sophisticated. And it is so basic that it is used in many applications. And this is an example. For example, we have, uh, is used in candles and it is even used uh, to manufacture string guns. What are the basic mechanical properties of uh, polyethylene? Uh, in terms of rigidity and flexibility, the material is flexible from minus 40 degrees C. 
Remember, we said PVC was flexible from minus 18 degrees C with plasticizers. Polyethylene is flexible at a much lower temperature and does not need any plasticizers. It is flexible by nature. It has a high ductibility, means that you can try to deform the material, make what we call plastic deformations, and you won't see any rupture. It will not break. It has a high impact strength as well, so it absorbs the energy and it doesn't uh, deform. Uh, it absorbs these energies and have some deformation, but again, no fracture, no fracture, no cracking. Very important uh, compared to PVC, the polyethylene do not have dehydrochloridization process, which means there is no need to add heat stabilizers into the material. So, as a consequence of it, it is a good thermal stability. It's stable in time, there is no stabilizers uh, moving out of, the, out of the material, and there is no dehydrochloranization process. The melting point of high density polyethylene is quite high. It's between 120 degrees C and 180 degrees C, while it is much lower for, uh, PVC, for, for PVC, 77, 88 degrees C. If we compare some basic properties which are important for corrosion prevention uh, tapes, uh, let's have a look to the electrical resistance and the water absorption of both material. So the electrical resistance is tested according to the EN 12068 standard. For polyethylene, the typical value will be 10 to the power of 16 ohm centimeter, while for PVC, it will be typically 10 to the power of 11 ohm centimeter. The water absorption, you can imagine, it's a very important property in terms of corrosion prevention. This can be tested according to this ASTM standard. So the test consists to immerse a, a, a part of the material into water and to weight, the, 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 uh, to weight the, the, the increase of the weight of the, of the material after a certain period in the water. So polyethylene will be typically an increase uh, of the water absorption of 0 0.02, 0 0.08%, while PVC with plasticizers uh, will have 0.2 to 1% to 1 So it is a factor uh, which is 10, between 10 times and 16, 17 times higher compared to polyethylene. Other basic properties, I, th I think it's interesting to notice what NACE uh, is mentioning about polyethylene in uh, its NACE CIP level two program. So CIP is coating in inspection program. So this is the special class uh, for coating inspector certified by NACE. Uh, there are two levels and the level two is the highest uh, level. Uh, level three, there is a, yes, a level three, which is a uh, 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 reversed of the, the, uh, the two others uh, level. So in this level two, NACE is giving uh, basic properties of polyethylene. And what NACE is saying is that the temperature resistance is close to 100 degrees C. It has a good low temperature flexibility. This is what we said. Uh, we said from minus 40 degrees C. It has an excellent resistance to chemicals. It has a good resistance to creep. This is what we said before by uh, the, the ductibility of the material. It has a high impact resistance. So it doesn't break with impact. It has an excellent tensile strength. So um, it has also a high electrical resistivity. It is not solu soluble in organic solvent, and it does not it does not crack under stress. So when you look at those those properties, basic properties, we can conclude that polyethylene is a perfect material for corrosion protection of tapes. Used, used for tapes. It is interesting to notice that the NACE class CIP level two does not give any property concerning PVC. So PVC is apparently uh, not considered as a basic material, uh, a raw material uh, for corrosion prevention. Now let's go to the bitumen. 
so the bitumen is also called asphalt. Uh, asphalt and bitumen are complex hydrocarbons mixture. And uh, you can find it in the nature, like for example, there are bitumen from the Dead Sea. But typically, most of the, most of the bitumen asphalt is, uh, is refined from uh, crude oil uh, distillation. So most of you probably knows the process. Crude oil is heated and then is introduced in this distillation uh, tower. So the, 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 the product on the top are the light product. So which is, for example, the gas here. And we have different fuels uh, for different uh, applications, car, airplanes, uh, diesel for, uh, uh, can be locomotives, can be cars. And on the right bottom of uh, the distillation tower, we have the most heavy material, which is in fact the asphalt and the bitumen. It's interesting to know that worldwide there are about 1,500 different types of crude oil, but only 7% of all those uh, types are suitable for a qualitative bitumen. So we already have from the nature a qualitative issue. It's very difficult to know what is the right composition of bitumen to be qualitative. Now let's talk about uh, the colloidal model. So the colloidal model is a model which has been developed by the scientists to explain the aging behavior of bitumen. So the colloidal model consists of, is represented like uh, in this uh, drawing. So what we have inside this drawing, we have what we call asphaltanes. Asphaltanes are the black ball here in the center. So they are non-soluble solid particles and very small, you know, the, ra the, the, the radius is, is, is in, in uh, nanometers. So it's a very small uh, particles. The uh, asphaltanes are coated by soluble resins, which are symbolized here uh, by this gray uh, circle. So altogether, the asphaltanes plus the resin, they are making what the scientists called micelles. So this is the micelles here in this uh, drawing. And around the micelles, there is an oily liquid matrix, which is, which is called maltenase. So the maltenase is very sensitive to the temperature. So when the, uh, the colloidal uh, model is as shown on this drawing, we have what we call a salt type bitumen, which is in fact a flexible, uh, a flexible bitumen. So the asphaltanes and the micelles, they are fully dispersed inside the uh, matrix, the liquid matrix, maltenase and they are not bonded to each other. They are free to move. What's happened when uh, the bitumen is aging? First thing is that because of the contact of oxygen, the asphaltanes are growing. And because the asphaltanes are growing, the micelles are growing as well. So we have here much bigger micelles after a certain period of time. The maltinase, which is the liquid forms, matrix inside, is evaporating. So what happened is that the micelles are clumping to each other and they form like a chain structure. So we have in this configuration, we have what we call a gel type bitumen. In a gel type bitumen, the ratio asphaltines and maltinase has increased, is much higher. In other words, the, bit, the bitumen uh, becomes art, brittle, and porous. How, how can we measure the aging of bitumen? There, is a, there are some uh, standard tests uh, from ASTM standard and even from EN standard. 
And the name of the test is Rolling Thing Film Oven Test. So what is this test? The test consists to put inside uh, small cylinders to put the bitumen. And the cylinders are fixed on the wheel. And you see here two empty uh, space where no cylinders has been placed. And the wheel is rolling, turning inside an oven. So what happened? Uh, the, the system is measuring the quantity of asphaltene uh, at the beginning, time zero, and measuring the quantity of, of asphaltene sorry, after 340 minutes, which is five hours and 40 minutes. So it's not a very long period compared to expected lifetime of a pipeline, for example. So we can see that the, uh, the growing of uh, the asphaltene is significant after only five hours and 40 minutes. So the asphaltene's expansion rate depends on the crude oil. So the quality of the crude oils from its, its origin. You remember there are 1,500 different types of crude oils. So make sure you have the good one. But it also depends, you can imagine, on the temperature. And very in, in, important to notice is that the asphaltene expansion, according to the colloidal model, is linear. So once it starts, it stays. It stays growing and growing and growing. So the structural aging of bitumen is the weak point of bitumen. Every bitumen has the same problem. Oxidation, contact with oxygen, is the most influential factor. Remember, I explained that oxidation makes the asphaltanes growing. So the aging of bitumen, that's a process we cannot be interrupt. Every bitumen expert will confirm this fact. The speed of uh, aging, as we just said, depends on the crude oil origin and on the temperature. Some polymers can be added to bitumen to try to reduce the aging. So it reduced, can reduce the aging, but it cannot stop the aging. It's, this phenomena is always there. So as a result of aging, the bitumen becomes art, brittle, and porous. So this is some illustration. You probably already see this uh, on streets uh, where asphalt are cracking. Uh, you can also imagine what happened on a pipeline, uh, cracks like this, or even uh, big cracks uh, on this uh, coating there. But, so I just said that polymers can be added to try to reduce the speed of aging. Those polymers are, uh, once they are mixed with the bitumen, we call it polymer modified bitumen, PMB. Uh, some polymers used typically are those SBS, SBE, and so on. They are added first to make the mixing sticky. By nature, the bitumen does not stick that much. So you need to make a sticky material to stick on steel and other, other materials so as to get some adhesion. And another properties of those polymers is to increase the plasticity window uh, of the, the mixture. But it's very difficult to find the right polymer. And a very good polymer reducing significantly the aging are very expensive, very difficult to find. And a major issue is that mixing polymers with bitumen is almost impossible. It's almost impossible to get a uh, uh, homogeneous mixture. The polymer chains will not break, and you won't have a very nice homogeneous mixture. So what happened because of this, uh, the polymer modified bitumen has mainly uh, uh, issues during storage. I will give you an example. Uh, this is uh, a piece of, of uh, a roll uh, that I have myself, a PVC bitumen that I, I, I am keeping in my office. Uh, and this is exactly how the, 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 the tape is looking after only five months in my office, so let's say at about 23 degrees C, 
the bitumen, uh, the compound is flowing. So this material cannot uh, be used anymore. I have the same tape, uh, but butyl rubber, uh, also in my office. And after the five months, they were close to each other. Uh, it's still in perfect uh, condition. So this aging issue is also clearly illustrated by uh, standards and the standards for the coating like EN 12068 or ISO 21890-3. When you do an aging test, which is 100 days in an oven, typically uh, the requirement of the standard is that the peel strength after 100 days must be minimum 75% of the original uh, peel strength. And when we do this exercise with, for example, a mesh bitumen tape, we only have 60% of the original adhesion. When we do the same exercise with a polyethylene butyl rubber tape, which is in this case co-extruded, we have more than 90% of the original adhesion. And I would honestly say that in practice, we have about 100% of the original adhesion. If we do the same with another aging test according to the standard ISO, which is hot water immersion for 28 days. After 28 days, the, the standard is requesting a minimum peel strength of 0 0.4 Newton by millimeter and an original peel strength of minimum one Newton by millimeter. So when you do this exercise with a mesh bitumen tape, the initial adhesion just passed the standard but after 28 days in hot water, uh, the typical result is between 0 0.2 and 0 0.4 Newton by millimeter. It doesn't pass the standard. While a polyethylene butyl rubber tape, triplied co extruded, largely, but really largely, exceeds the standard. And as you can see, there is no loss of adhesion after hot water immersion with polyethylene and butyl rubber. Let's have a look to the aging. Another aging issue with bitumen is the porosity issue. And to understand the porosity, we have a look to this uh, standard, which is a cathodic protection standard for onshore uh, pipelines. Uh, let's look at the chapter talking about the current demand. demand. So the chapter 8.4 is uh, talking about the current demand for cathodic protection. Uh, chapter 4.842, uh, uh, talk about coating breakdown factor and uh, give the total current demand by, by this formula, where I thought is the total current demand. K is a contingency factor, which is more than 1.25 in the practice. Uh, J is the density of current and F is the coating breakdown factor. Uh, if F is high, uh, the, the, the cathodic protection current demand is also high. So what is uh, the evolution in time of the coating breakdown factor? It is given by the standard, again, by an initial factor plus the increasing of, the, of this factor uh, times uh, a certain time uh, in year, explained in years. So we have the average yearly increase of FF, and we have uh, T, which is the time explained in, in years. And the standard is giving a typical values uh, according to different materials. And you can see that for polyethylene, those are uh, the initial uh, coating breakdown factors given by the standard, and this is the, in the average increase by year. While cold tar urethane, uh, which is a material very close to bitumen, uh, is significantly higher and to have a better understanding of this uh, table, I just make a graph. Uh, the, the red line is the evolution of breaking factor, coating break, breaking factor, breakdown factor of, of bitumen. And you can see that it increased much, much, much faster than uh, polyethylene. The same standard uh, gives also the opportunity uh, to calculate the current demand based on the current density. It's the, net, the next chapter. Uh, the same formula, but with current density, 
and typical current density are, are given by the standards in table number three with relatively low value for polyethylene and polypropylene and much higher values for coal tar and bitumen uh, coatings. So this il illustrates again the fact that with time the coating aged and becomes porous. The last chapter is the uh, butyl rubber. So again, a quick history it was uh, discovered uh, by Mr. Faraday. I think it's interesting to notice this. Mr. Faraday is well known for all these elect electromagnetic uh, studies, uh, but he discovered ISO butylane. In Germany, BASF uh, developed the poly ISO butylane, the PIB. Uh, it was sold under the name of Opanol B, and uh, uh, the, the product has been uh, developed uh, into butyl rubber by the oil company uh, called Standard Oil. And today, uh, the production of butyl rubber is uh, mainly produced by two big players. One is ExxonMobil, it's a descendant of uh, Standard Oil, based in the USA, and the other one is based, is a German company, uh, come from Bayer, uh, because Bayer bought uh, Polista rubber in Canada in 1919. So butyl rubber, uh, uh, in fact, scientific name uh, is isobutylene isoprene uh, rubber, is in fact, again, a chemical reaction called poly polymerization of poly isobutylene, PIB, and isopropene. Uh, isoprene, sorry, isoprene. So this is uh, the, the, the molecule, the chain, as it is uh, after pol polymerization. And uh, you can see that it is a, a mixture of carbon and hydrogen atoms uh, with a, a structure which is very close uh, to polyethylene. And I remember you, polyethylene is one of the simplest uh, molecules. So the basic properties of uh, ISO butylene isopro, uh, isoprene rubber or butyl rubber. So it has a low permeability to air and gases and moisture. So one of the typical use is uh, the tires or the tubes. It has a glass transition temperature of minus 67 degrees C. Uh, maximum operating temperature up to 100 degrees C, but can reach 150 if the material is vulcanized with sulfur. Uh, very good resistance to aging and weathering. So it's a stable material, doesn't age. It has good hardness and tensile strength properties. Doesn't need a lot of fillers. And it's a safe material. For example, again, can be used as a, can be can be um, used for shringums. So, looking at the basic properties, yeah, it's perfect. It's a good material for corrosion prevention. If we look at what NACE is saying in the same class, uh, CIP level two, concerning uh, butyl rubber, they say that the same uh, temperature resistance is close to 100 degrees C. It's a pliable, moldable material, so flexibility. Uh, it's used as a mastic, as an adhesive, as a sealant. Excellent resistance to acids. So lo again, looking at the performance and the properties given by NACE, uh, it's, it's confirmed uh, what we said before. It's a good material for uh, corrosion prevention tapes. Again, uh, please notice that bitumen uh, is not mentioned by NACE as a coating uh, in the NACE CIP level two program and even level one. So butyl rubber is stable over time. And the best way to know it and to demonstrate this is what we discussed two weeks ago. That was the peel tests on uh, polyethylene butyl rubber tape after 40 years in operation. We have very nice cohesive brake failure with a peel strength which is uh, still much higher than any uh, than uh, the, the the current uh, standards. 
So let's go to the conclusions. So let's make a, a summary of different, some basic properties of different materials. So we have one couple, PVC bitumen, and the second couple, polyethylene and butyl rubber. So the low temperature flexibility is significantly different between the two couples. The melting point is also uh, different between the two couples. We talk about electrical resistance. The difference is mentioned there. Water absorption is of course very important for corrosion prevention. And as we said before, we have between 10, 10 times to 16 times more water absorption with PVC uh, bitumen uh, systems. But the most important, the most important uh, property is the aging. Uh, I hope now you have a better understanding uh, concerning the aging of PVC and bitumen. Uh, PVC uh, be, uh, generates cracks when it aged, while bitumen becomes porous, brittle when it aged. On the other hand, polyethylene and butyl rubber are both stable. And one of the way to, 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 to know it, to demonstrate that, is that the performance according to the uh, uh, coating standards, uh, performance like hot water immersion and aging uh, in an oven, uh, the results are excellent. Why? They are very poor for PVC and bitumen. So we have a poor coating system and we have a good coating system on the other hand. So PVC bitumen, now you understand that from their intrinsic material properties, PVC and bitumen are not really suitable as a basic base material for polymeric tape. PVC needs plasticizers and stabilizers, which both disappeared, evaporate with aging. The bitumen shows structural aging. You remember the colloidal model. It is impossible to avoid this with time. The bitumen will become art brittle and porous. So PVC bitumen tapes show poor performance, especially when they are testing on a long-term basis. We do look at again the polyethylene butyl rubber. According to the material basic properties, both polyethylene and butyl rubber are well suited uh, for polymeric tape. Polyethylene does not need plasticizers, it does not need stabilizers, and thus naturally it has an excellent thermal stability. While the butyl rubber is also stable and strong. It stays a sealant component and does not age like bitumen. So polyethylene butyl rubber show excellent performance and even more excellent when they are testing according, uh, uh, testing for long-term performance. And as we explained uh, two weeks ago, uh, this is even more better when uh, the, the tape is manufactured by using the co-extrusion process and by uh, a structure which is the three-ply structure. So PVC bitumen is in fact uh, a whole fashion technology uh, with some storage issues uh, and a significant long risk on the performance on long term. So it's a simple two-ply system. The storage are very sensitive and it cracks after a while, after a certain period. While the PE butyl rubber is a modern technology uh, with modern production uh, systems like co-extrusion and three-ply system, and it shows outstanding performance that no, no other tape system can show, like the track record we discuss uh, after 40 years of, of operating. So it's a modern structure, three-ply, co-extruded. There is no uh, storage issues and very long-term performance. So this is the end of uh, the presentation. Uh, thank you so much for your attention and uh, 
I'm ready for uh, eventual questions. Ken, are you still there? Yes, I, I'm, okay. I'm still here. We've got seven minutes to go before I have to dash off. So um, um, we, we'd like to take that. Um, the, there's been a, a question, Luke, about the carcinogenic uh, properties that you mentioned uh, that are uh, present with the PVC plasticizers. And um, there's been a request from uh, Steve Crawley for, to explain that um, modern PVC plasticizers that are used are not considered to be carcinogenic. Um, and I, I think you'll be able to confirm that, that the modern plasticizers aren't necessarily carcinogenic. But he further asks if you can comment on uh, why the construction and utilities industry use PVC pipe if there is an ongoing risk of dehydrochlorination and chlorine formation from PVC. So the question is why 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 is why are PVC pipes used so much if there's a risk of a dehydrochlorination and chlorine formation from PVC? Uh, honestly, I'm not an expert in PVC pipes, uh, but even PVC pipes uh, are aging as well. Uh, I, I, I show a picture. I, I, I show a picture of, of PVC pipes uh, leaking. Uh, I don't remember where it was, and I cannot I go out of the show mode. Um, I think it's mainly a question of cost. Uh, PVC is probably cheaper than polyethylene. And yes. for what is required is just enough. While uh, pipelines transporting oil and gas are sensitive assets and need a material of much higher uh, performance with uh, higher quality. So what fits for a PVC pipe, which will transport uh, rain water or, or waste stage water in the house, uh, I don't think we can compare this with a PVC, which can be used on a very high pressure gas transportation pipeline. Uh, the risks uh, are uh, totally different. That, that's, if that's possible. What about if, um, if the PVC pipe is buried, then I think the risk of, of um, accelerated aging from UV is, is eliminated, isn't it? Yes, the UV, of course, yes. There is no UV in the soil. Uh, but the uh, dehydrochlorinization process is due to... Uh, um, I, I, can, I would like to, to find the, the, the slide about uh, about this. Uh, so this is this one. Uh, okay. This is this one. So th this this is the uh, uh, intrinsic uh, aging of PVC. Uh, this happened with with some heat, and some heat is not specifically high temperature. Uh, it's something uh, something close to zero. It starts. So this phenomena is. Uh, intrinsic reaction uh, of PVC. Uh, okay. Do, so it, do you think you do you think you could put on the screen, Luke, the the table which showed the porosity factors related to bitumen? You had on the, table. on the same slide. Uh, there was a there was a table that you had that yes. showed the porosity of. Um, Yes. Yes. And the the question is: Do do those figures relate to bitumen just alone, or when it is part of a tape system? Um, so you mean this? No, no. Where there's a, you had a table which showed some porosity figures. For bitumen. 
It was before this, I think. Uh, no, I talk about porosity with uh, the cathodic protection standard, the ISO standard. I, I seem to remember you had a table that showed, or some a slide that showed the difference in the porosity between bitumen and, and other materials. Uh, this is this one. Uh, that's so, a, this is the coating breakdown factor, which is the image of the porosity. Yeah. And coal tar urethane bitumen tapes, uh, sorry, coatings are uh, well okay. known the, by the, the standard to be much more porous than polyethylene. And this is confirmed in the two tables from the standard, the table two related to the coating breakdown factor and the table three related to uh, the, the design current density, which is much higher when coal tar or bitumous, bituminous uh, coatings are used. And this is what the standard says. Okay. Cathodic protection standard. Okay, I think, um, I think we, we have an additional question. Um, maybe um, what we'll do is at the end of this presentation, because when we download it, we can send the questions to Luke. So if anybody has any further queries, um, as we're now come to the end of the um, webinar, um, I think that we will be sending out the presentation. Um, I can also put in Luke's contact details so that if anybody has any further questions and then the, the question that Scott has asked from Andrew, um, we'll pass that on to Luke and we will send out the answers um, to everybody after the presentation has finished, if that's okay. Yes, sure. Perfect, all right. Thank, so, um, thank, thank you very much, Kate. Perhaps no I worries. Could, uh, I think we, we could perhaps all thank uh, Luke, I'm sorry you can't get a round of applause on a virtual uh, call, Luke, but thank you for putting the presentation together and um, explaining very clearly what the, what the issues are. And hopefully everybody will go away with a new understanding of the importance of correctly selecting your, your tape, both, both to be environmentally friendly and to ensure that you have long-term corrosion protection. Thank you very much, Luke. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Ken, for assisting me and thank you, everybody.